the last guitar player we had was named Craig Goldie, and uh, Craig played on the Dream Evil album and on half of the Sacred Heart tour. When Vivian Campbell was gone, we continued on with the next half of our tour, and Craig came out and he took his place. And then we did the next album, which was called Dream Evil. And uh, it was an album that wasn't really right as far as the writing went between Craig and myself. I think Craig always felt that, that I wanted to recreate Rainbow again. And so we didn't quite hit it right as far as writing went. Um, he's still a dear friend and he's a great musician. It just, you know, we, we were smart. We said, this doesn't work. So we had to look for another guitar player. So I listened to about uh, four or 5,000 tapes of audition. Uh, people who sent me tapes. And I listened to all of them. And about halfway through, I had a tape from Rowan. And at the time, he was only 17 years old. Probably only 16 years old. He probably lied about his age. Did you know that? Did I know when that? You heard a tape, when you heard a tape, did you know that he was just, just 17 years old? Yeah, he sent me a letter as well. Oh. And the letter said, I'm 17, but he was only 16. And he sent me a picture, and his hair was a bit shorter then, which didn't really matter to me. Um, and after listening to all the tapes that I listened to, there were some that I would see the photo and say, oh, I hope he's not good, because he might have been like seven feet <laughs> tall or something, I'm not really that big, you know. And I'd say, I hope he's terrible. And most of them were terrible, so it wasn't too much of a problem. And then Rowan's tape came, and it wasn't a matter of him being too tall, um, it was a matter perhaps of him being too young. Uh, I was a bit afraid that I, who had been in this business for so long, might not have the patience to deal with someone who was so young. Um, but he was just, his tape was so good, and he was, I could tell instantly that this was the kind of guitar player I was looking for. He laughs, but it's true. I've got nice legs as well. And he has nice, beautiful <laughs> knees. Um, but I put the tape aside because I was afraid about the, the age. And then six months later, I kept listening to tapes, and just no one was better than Rowan. So we brought him over for an audition. And it was, it, was, it was perfect, it was right. And then we found, of course, that he was a lot more mature you know, for a 17-year-old kid. He was a lot more mature than most 17-year-olds are. Uh, and he wasn't those, that kind of guitar player who stayed in his room all day long and just played guitar. That's all he had in his mind, one thing. I didn't want that, and luckily he wasn't that. He's a natural player. He plays just from his feelings. So it, it just all worked out very, very right. If you wait long enough, you find the right thing, always. Wow. Aren't you, uh, I mean, he is a young boy. Yes, he is. Uh, aren't you a bit in a position of a father, a father figure, kind of like that? Well, I think you'd have to ask Rowan that. I don't think I'm a father yes, figure, father Rowan. No, absolutely not. I don't think so. We feel so. <laughs> there's just, see, there's never, ever been any difference in how we feel in rehearsal, in life. You know, we go out, do things. There's no, it's never, ever been anything like that. We just feel, I mean, absolutely not. I think it's because I, I don't feel that way. Exactly. Yeah. I don't feel older than 18 years old ever. I, I, I just don't think that you can. I don't think that, in this business, I think it keeps you very young. Uh, you play for young people all the time. Of course you get older, sure you do. But my attitude hasn't changed. And I think that Rowan felt that. Uh, and I wanted him to feel that, that. To me, the most important thing was the music and the music that we were going to make together. Of course, I'm a teacher. I, I, you know, I teach him so. not only things about music, but and he Life. teaches me things about music, but I teach him experiences that I've had. So I try to make a shortcut for him so he doesn't have to go through the horrible things perhaps that I've gone through. Um, and if that's being a father figure, then that's okay. That doesn't matter to me, you know. I mean, but I'm not that, and we don't treat each other that way. I mean, I'm, he's not my son, and that's really the bottom line. He's not my son. He's just a person, that's all. And the, the show last night, the first show we ever did, I was like, after the show, I was dead. <laughs> and he was like, you're going to have to get used to it. You know, I mean, I'm the, <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> well, it's really funny because dead. here he is, 18, 18 years old, and he was passed out. I mean, I'm 115 years old, you know, or maybe 215, and I'm still, I still want to do it. You know, and I think, you know, he'll, 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 he'll understand yeah, that. He'll, he'll get to that point. Yeah, so. When you have that much adrenaline pumping through you, when you, when you play a show, it's, uh, you can be as tired as you... You could be the most tired person on earth, but when you when you do it, you can't stop thinking about it, and you never can fall asleep. And, and he'll get to that point. And yeah, if he doesn't, that's fine. I, I'm, I'm I'm happy for him. I'm glad he could fall asleep. You know, he can be what I never could be. I can never fall asleep. Tonight went great. I'm just wide awake. He's awake tonight. Show.
And I think a lot of it was a lot of stress for him last night, you know, for he and Teddy, for our bass player, too. Mm. I mean, these two guys have, have really never played in front of a lot of people before. Jens Johansson has, Simon Wright has, of course, you know. Uh, and for them, it must have been so stressful. I don't know what it must have been like. Uh, I don't remember what it must have been like. It was never like that for me because I was brought up in a different way. I started as a, you know, as a, as a real child, five years old, you know, starting to do those kind of things. So for me, it was a gradual progression. But for Rowan, it was right away, bang, he's on a stage with Metallica, who are, you know, a mega band with a mega audience, and with Dio, who are, you know, certainly have been a mega band and are going to be again, and certainly have a something, nothing to prove. We. we but it must be very difficult for he and Teddy both. And I think it it took its toll mentally on them last That's, night. Yeah, you know, sure it did. But they they handled it very, very well. It was me seeing the magazines that heard that Craig left. And um, in that situation, always there's, you know, this thing, I need another guitarist. But I was like, oh, I want to send a tape. But it seemed such a, you know, remote possibility that, I mean, Ronnie did listen to every single tape, every single one. But it even seemed a remote possibility that my tape would get listened to, because that's how you feel, you know. And uh, it was the last day, I had a friend, uh, I had a friend, who uh, lived in Cambridge, who's out in LA with me now. And uh, the last day before he left for LA, he said, you know, send the tape, you can't, anything to lose, the least thing to say is no. So that night, you know, I got together a tape recorder and did a tape, you know, with my guitar, and sent it. Just, you know, because this guy, you know, he said, go on, do it, you've nothing to lose. You know, I, I'd do it, but for the fact that I'm going to study at GIT. And uh, took a, it took a long while, and I'd, I hadn't forgotten I sent it, but you'd, I was deliberately, you know, trying to not think about the fact, because you'd never expect anything. And uh, six months later, Wendy phoned up and said uh, that they liked the tape. And uh, I was going, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, like that. A new record is out called Luck of the Wolves. And uh, before I heard the record, people told me, well, this is the kind of deal we, we loved five years ago. This is the way that you feel? Absolutely do. Yes, I do. I do. I think I'm very proud of this album. I'm proud of the album, not, not from my, my standpoint, because I am what I am. I'm, I've, when you've written as many things with as many wonderful people as I have, you find your own place in the world, and you're always going to be what you are. Uh, for me, it was an opportunity for uh, for all of us in this band to do what we wanted to do, not what we were told to do. When your career carries on for a while, you have a record company who pays for your record. I mean, it's, it's they who I thank for giving us the money to make a record. And you have to answer to them. So a lot of times they say to you, it must be more accessible. You must make smaller songs so radio will play it. And you're, of course, torn between the American market and the European market. The European market is much more of a classical orient, classically oriented market. In Rainbow, for a great example, we tried to make records that were uh, shadows of Bach and Beethoven and Chopin and little classical bits because it's what Richie and I loved. Um, I've always tried to carry that, that, that banner with me, that we should be something a little bit different than most. Uh, that went away at times in, in my career in Dio, because record companies ask you to do different things. We need a, we need a, America. Hey man, we need a single dude. You know, in Europe it's, we don't need that kind of a record. We need something that you did before, like Rainbow, like Black Sabbath. So you're torn, but you can't make two albums. So you do the best that you can. This album, I'm I'm very proud of it because it took so long to do. It took such a, it, it was so heart wrenching for me. It was very difficult. It was made in two parts with a band that I loved, the band that created what Dia was, with Vivian and with Jimmy and with Vinny and with Claude and then with Craig, um, and then it went away. And the other half of the album was done with, well, actually the whole album was done, of course, with Rowan, but the rest of it was done with Jens and with Teddy and with Simon, and it was really tears you apart to, it's very difficult to say, uh, I, I knew what I wanted the album to be when we first started, but with the changes that happened inside of it, it made it go in different directions for me. And I'm just pleased that we were, number one, able to finish the record and do it. Number two, I'm glad that it, it came out 
to be the record that leads to the best product, which will be the next album that we make, that will be the best product. I found that all the first albums that I've done have been the best ones. Uh, some people have felt that the second albums that we've done in some cases have been the best ones. I always felt that the first Rainbow album was my favorite, but everyone on earth thinks that Rainbow Rising was the best album that we did with Rainbow. Uh, people think that Holy Diver was the best album we did, and I think that Last in Line and Holy Diver are both reflections of the best band that Dio ever had. This one, because of the problems inside of it with changing personnel, changing people, and with Rowan, you know, having to learn the way that, that Dio works, this will mean that the next album will be the best one. Yeah. It will be the best one, because now the band knows itself. It's only played two shows. This is only the second show we've ever played. I'm so proud of them. I, th I think that they're just magnificent mu musicians. I think that Rowan and Jens and Hansen are... Uh, they, I just think that they're so wonderful. They really they're just, they come from another place to me. I've worked with great musicians before, but I think they are the two best that I've ever played with before. And this shows that... Simon, who's so basic and so strong and leaves great room for the songs to expand themselves, this is, this is going to be, other than Holy Diver and Last in Line, the, the best of the deal. I can never say that... Uh, Metallica power. Yeah. That was Metallica, lads. The best of Metallica. No. Oh. This is the beginning of 1990 for Dio. Yeah. We're lucky we have a new decade to deal with. Um, Maybe it's a coincidence that 1990 is the beginning of another form of this band. You know, we try to remain current. We don't look over our shoulders. We don't think that even though Holy Diver is always mentioned, even though Rainbow Rising is always mentioned, Heaven and Hell is always mentioned, I don't look back on it. We do those songs because they're wonderful songs, because they, they deserve to be done. People have come to us because, and to me because of the things that I've done in the past and the things that we've, we've done now and the things we will do in the future. This is again a springboard for us to, you know, to do, to, to do even better things. I couldn't be happier with this album. I think it's a wonderful album. I think it's a, I think it's a great statement to be made that there, there are better things to be done. When you have me, you get what you see, you get what you hear. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to suddenly start writing the wall. Um, I'm not going to start saying baby, 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 baby. Um, I'm not going to feel that I have to go back to talking about swords and sorcery. I'll do that if I feel that I should. But I'm a person who writes about people. I write about people and for people. I write about the people who have allowed me to do this. I write for lonely people. I write for searching people. Uh, I don't think enough, enough musicians do that. I don't think they write for those who really care about themselves. You know, the greatest compliment to me that has ever, ever, ever been made was in Stockholm, Sweden, in uh, most of it, 1986, uh, during the Sacred Heart Tour. We were leaving the hotel really early in the morning, and there were you know, quite a few kids waiting to see us off as we went through the lobby. And this little girl dressed in black leather and black leather pants, and this sad expression on her face fought her way to the front. She came to me and she grabbed me by my arm, and she said, Ronnie, I want you to know that rock and roll children, you wrote that for me. And I said, yes, I did. I did write that for you. She said, my life has been what you wrote. I've been sad in my life because people think that I'm strange because I love rock and roll and because I look different and because I care about music. But I know you wrote that song for me. Just like the letters I get, I would have killed myself if I didn't have a Dio song to listen to. Look, I'm not God. I don't write those songs to stop people from committing suicide. I write what comes from my heart and from my soul. And if it affects them that way, then I'm not going to change. I'll always be what I am. I feel for them and I write songs for them. I am a reflection of them. I am the mirror of their soul. I always will be. So, you, sure, you can't expect anything different from Dio, because Dio is what Dio is. The difficult thing for me, Harold, is that people start to call me a legend now. They say, the legend. I speak to interviewers and they say, they, they don't ask me questions first. They say to me, they always start by saying, I don't know what to say because I'm not talking to a legend. I'm talking to my favorite. I'm talking to the person who inspired me. And, and, and I say, thank you. I, I don't know what else to say. I don't want to be placed on that pedestal. I don't want to be. I, it's not fair for them to do that to me. I'm not a legend. I'm not that. If they feel that about me, then I hope I can change their mind by letting them know that I'm, I'm, I make mistakes, and uh, I cry when I'm sad, and laugh when I'm happy, and I'm not a good person, and I am a good person, and I care about myself a lot. Um, 
it makes me feel, as I said before, it makes me feel very humble, and I can only say thank you. I think perhaps some people, when I say that, think that uh, that I'm that that's not real, that I don't really mean that, and I do. I don't take compliments well. I don't take compliments well because I always think I can do better. I always want to do better. I always think I can be a better singer. I can be a better writer. I can be a better person. Um, so I just try to say thank you for that. Uh, it's just wonderful that they think of me that way. But again, I'm not God, and I'm not someone who can heal their wounds. I can't. I can't stop their diseases. I couldn't stop Sammy Davis Jr. from dying. If I could have, I would have. Um, I can't stop anyone from suffering. I can only try to help in, with the tools that have been given to me by the kids who have put me on this, this wonderful pedestal. You know, I, I'm only just a, you know, a fragile little person. I'm not anything more than that. I just do the best I can. That's all. all right. Bands like Deep Purple, who, who preceded Rainbow, of course. Deep Purple, who was my favorite band on earth. Richie Blackmore was my, my, my hero, my idol. He was, and I was lucky enough in my life to work with him and to learn from him, to learn by his mistakes and learn from the good things that he did. But these were people who wrote the book. They wrote the rules. Jimi Hendrix wrote the rules for guitar players. Richie Blackmore wrote another set of rules for guitar players. Jimmy Page wrote a set of rules for songs, the way they should be put together, for finding great talent like Robert Plant, like John Bonham. Today, the people who are being successful, and there aren't that many of them really who can be megastars, people like Metallica, for example, are bands that learn from that. And I think the only way you can be a mega band is to create your own uniqueness. And there are too many bands that are a diluted form of Led Zeppelin these days. You can only, a whole lot of love is only written once. It can't be written again. You can never make it better. Stairway to Heaven will never ever be written better than that. Anything you can name, almost anything that Led Zeppelin ever did that you can think of has been attempted by other bands and they haven't even come close because they wrote the rules. And the problem is that people, bands, don't try to be unique anymore. They don't try to be something different. They say, we learn from Purple, we learn from Zeppelin, we learn from, uh, from Sabbath, the first great and the only really heavy metal band. They haven't learned to be themselves. They haven't taken little bits of what those bands have done and then made it bigger, made it with more scope. They've only copied. Excuse me. Yes. Bands like, not like Sabbath, they're not the same kind of band. But the others are pale imitations. Great White, for example. I um, mean, you know, I mean, that, that was, that, that was Mata Hoople, you know, I mean, I don't, you know, where's your success? What have you written that we remember? Tesla write their own songs. I mean, Cinderella, too, for example. Yeah. Cinderella write good things in their own, you know, on their own. They're a different kind of band. Um, Dawkins were a shadow of scorpions, you know? Don Dawkins, you know, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, you know, God bless Don, I love him. He's great. He's a wonderful person. He's a great friend of mine, and he's had a lot of success. But I don't find them different than the Scorps. Um, Michael Schenker, great guitar player, you know? I mean, he's, he's, he suffers because he doesn't know what to do with his life. He should have said, screw this, I'm going to be Michael Schenker again. Uh, Black Sabbath, they should not have, Tony Iommi should not have carried on. Once you have Sabbath that was the Sabbath with Ozzy, which was the first, again, great, wonderful heavy metal band, and then you have the second edition, which was the Dio edition, that was a special band. It was a special, unique sounding kind of band who made music for the 80s. Sabbath was making music for the late 60s and parts of the 70s. And the Sabbath I was in was making music for the late 70s and into the 80s, which influenced everybody again. Everyone said, yes, it can happen again. But what did they do? They didn't carry on what we did. They, didn't, they just didn't do it. Um, it's just so difficult. You have to be so, so linear, so sing singular about what you do. You have to say, look at Metallica. That's another great example. They said, we don't need your press. We don't care what you think. We're going to play this. Anthrax said, screw you, we're going to play what we play. You don't like it? Too bad. We don't need the press to make us what we are. We need the kids to make us what we are. And that's what these bands have done. The kids have said, we love you because you are us, not because you're something else that was. You're us. We need more bands like that. Yeah. We need more bands like that. Where they're coming from? They're coming from places like Tesla are coming from. And they will. They will. 
but not as not as many as did before. There are too many bands now. There are too many bands that are the same now. We have Los Angeles, for example. Well, Guns N' Roses have a lot more to prove. Guns N' Guns and Roses have sold, you know, millions and millions of albums, but that's only one. And they have seemed to have rested upon their laurels for the last couple of years. Um, you know, maybe Axel needs to tie another headband around his, you know, turn his hat to the side instead of in the back. I don't know. Um, I think he has a lot of talent. I think that they, um, they were able to have a lot of success because of the dissatisfaction of the kids with life in general. And I think he reflected that, and the band reflected it. Slash stuck his hat over his head and said, I don't have to look at you. I think kids these days say, I'll stick my hat over my head. I don't have to look at you parents. I don't have to look at you teachers. I don't have to look at you government. Screw you, I'm gonna be what I'm gonna be. And I think that they are the, they're the heroes of, you know, of kids who are dissatisfied with social problems, with terrible economic problems, with uh, homelessness, with prostitution, with drugs. I mean, we've created this world. All of us as human beings have created this world that we live in. And Guns N' Roses is an example of this. That's what they are. Uh, but they have to prove themselves more and more as a band. They can't rest upon the 12 million albums that they sold. No, no more than White Snake can. See, w if we look at it, if we if we examine it, White Snake sold eight million records with this mega album that they had, the first one, and two million with the second one. And now someone else is coming to take their place to sell their eight million records. That's not a kick up White Snake's behind. That's, it's, it's a great band. David, you know, a great singer, and he's created what he's created. But it shows you how quickly it can change. The only people who will remain are those who say. We care about what we do, not about what you want us to be. Like Dio cares about itself. It cares about what it can create, not to have to follow a fashion trend, not to have to follow a Guns N' Roses trend. Look at all the people who want to be Guns N' Roses. Yeah. I mean, even to the point of look at all the bands with guns in their names. You know, I mean, come on, give it a rest, will you? It's stupid. It's just stupid. As far as the L.A. scene goes, there are too many bands with interchangeable parts. You can screw most of their heads off and screw another head onto the other person, and you're gonna get the same. You're gonna get the same voice, the same attitude, the same look, the same everything. That's not where music is. Where great music is being made is in a little town in Texas, in the little town in Germany, perhaps in the little town in Austria, in the little town in Iceland. That's where great music will be made because they have no fashions to follow. They follow, they follow what they have to do because they're not they're not saturated with that kind of an attitude. They just do what they want to do. Those are where the great bands come from. That's where ZZ Top comes from, that little old band from Texas who said, yeah, hey, this is what we do. That's where Leonard Skinner came from. That's where they came from. We don't need you. We play what we play. That's where, uh, that's where um, Greg Allman, the Allman Brothers came from. We don't need this. This is what we do. That's where, uh, right, that's, where every, you know, that's where the great bands come from. They come from places where they create, not where people have said, you must be this. But we live in a different age. You must understand that. That different age dictates that everyone has to follow a pattern. The rules now are being written so that we can all be warrant and we can all be Guns N' Roses. But we can't all be that. We can't. We can't. We just can't be that. We have to find those those great bands. Look, we've got Russia opening up now. There's some great musicians there, you know. And they will be. We'll find them somewhere. They'll find us. That's what's, that's what's important. V. Gates, I'm Ronnie James Dio. I'm Rowan Robertson. Oh! <laughs> We're both here with Harold and his heavy metal party. Right. And I hope you're also with us coming on Donnerstag, 17.40, FS1. See ya. Dudes. Molager.